Your super brain power has driven us mad, Penguin. Something snapped. Well, we don't care if we go up the river for a hundred years. We're getting you first. Quick, my things. Self-defense. The dynamic duel has flipped their wings. <laughs> Welcome back, citizens, to an all-new episode of the Bat Cave Podcast. It's your old bat chum, John S. Drew here, and it's a special episode here. It's a special from the files of the Bat Computer here, as we're taking a look at some of the best of Batman as we get ready to see the release of the Batman television series on DVD and Blu-ray. And since this is such a special occasion, and we're going to be doing this as a series of episodes this whole week... I asked Mr. Dan Greenfield from 13thDimension.com to join me in talking about some of the best of Batman. So, hey, Dan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John. Great to be here. You know, anybody who's listening, I apologize for the sound of my voice. I'm uh, fighting off a little bit of a cold, but I am ready to talk about all things Batman. Did you take some bat lozenges? Well, Alfred told me to drink hot water with honey. And it's worked so far, and my utility belt is fully stocked with bat lozenges for the purpose of this series of podcasts. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These are going to be brief ones, folks. We're going to each day focus on a different aspect of Batman that most people tend to think of when they think of the 66 series. And in addition, we're going to be having a little contest here at the end of each episode, including today's one. We're going to be announcing the winner of a giveaway that we're doing here in conjunction with 13th Dimension and the Bat Cave Podcast. It's a joint thing we're doing here. Dan, what is the first prize we're going to be offering today at the end of the show? Well, today is going to be a Funko Cesar Romero Joker bobblehead, which if you haven't seen it, it's great because it's got a great visage of the Cesar Romero Joker. He's got that maniacal look. He's got the mustache. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a fun little item. I love that. I love that they make sure that they even include the mustache. It's something that all of the merchandisers have been very detailed about, and I think it's hilarious to see. So we're going to announce that winner at the end of the podcast, but let's get into the podcast itself here. Today we're going to be talking about bat villains. I mean, you know, when it comes to Batman, he's got some of the best villains out of all the heroes when it comes to a rogues gallery. He's got the best villains. And when it comes to the 66 series, he not only has the ones from the comic book, but there's also the ones that the producers of the TV series created just for the series, some which have moved on into the comic book. Yes. Yeah. Especially in the Batman 66 comic book that DC now produces, they've been using actually more of those villains than some of the original villains. They've been having a field day with False Face and Egghead, and, and they've even done Black Widow, even though she doesn't look like Tallulah Bankhead, it's, it's based on the character. It's, it's, it's great to see that stuff starting to creep into the, into the rest of the comic world. It's so great to see that and to also see that, you know, the success of Batman 66 has encouraged DC now to do Wonder Woman 77. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because my son and I were talking about what they could do next. I would love to see them do Superman 78, have a whole series of uh, comics based on, on the Christopher Reeve movies, I think would be, would be a blast. But it's been an amazing thing for Bat fans, which is why, you know, for the week of leading into the release of the DVD or the Blu-ray, we're also going to be profiling people this week on the website who have been like the you know big bat fans who have kind of kept the bat signal lit over the last you know almost 50 years who are really into this we 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 do a lot of batman 66 coverage at the site which is why I'm really pleased that we're able to do this together so that's we're going to be you know shining a spotlight on on a lot of that sort of stuff this week as we get ready for the actual release itself, which I cannot wait for. I know. I mean, I'm, 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 it's just amazing. Yes, it is. So let's get into this. Let's talk about our favorite bat villains. I mean, I'm going to say right now as a disclaimer for this and and future episodes that we're doing here in this week, 
my picks for best villains and best other things are going to be based on what I've reviewed so far. I just don't want to get into saying I enjoyed something that may be from, say, a third season Batgirl episode. And then when I get to it, I suddenly realize that's the kid in me that enjoyed it. And God, it just doesn't work anymore. As I found with some of these Batman episodes. It's unfortunate, but then there are others that maybe as a kid I didn't appreciate as much. And I'm finding I actually enjoy them more. You know, that's one of the things that I have found is, is watching the show as an adult is exactly that. And I've asked some people lately about that very issue, about the, how much your perception changes. And, and one of those will actually come up when we discuss the bad villains. So it's true that there are some things that... Now, I have watched the show all the way through in not the greatest quality, but I, I have seen all of them relatively recently. So I'll discuss things that you might not have uh, mentioned yet. I don't think it's going to be uh, much of a problem. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Absolutely. Chime in. Let's get things started. The first villain I've got top of my list. I mean, again, I'm not really doing this in any order, but it just happens to come up there because it's right off the top is the Riddler. Exploded and blown that to bits. Dreams come true. Batman and Robin dead. Dead! Dead! My cup runneth over. Upscope. Forget about them now and go find that lost treasure. Oh, oh let me savor this moment so divine. Seeing Batman and Robin dead is more important than any. In particular, we're talking about Frank Gorshin's Riddler. I mean, right out of the gate from the very first episode, you know, he propelled this show into the, you know, mainstream. I mean, he made it what, I mean, honestly, as much as everybody, Batman and Robin, Adam West and Burt Ward, I think if any of those other early episodes had been the first episode to go out there, I don't know how well it might have done. Honest to God, Frank Gorshin just hits it right out of the park. He takes a minor league character from the comic books and just suddenly, you know, brings such life to it that you can't help but be curious about who this character is and what his obsession with riddles are. You know, it's funny that you said, you know, there's one thing that you said there that, uh, that jumps out to me. People forget just how influential this show was on the comics in certain ways, and also in popular culture, because the Riddler was a nothing character. And they decided to use him for the show. They got Frank Gorshin, and because of that performance, the Riddler became an A-list villain in the comics, and he is to this day. Even in the Jim Carrey version, in the movies that they did, you know, 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, was a variation on the Frank Gorshin version. When people think of the Riddler, they think of, I mean, now when they think of the Joker, they think of Heath Ledger, but they still, when they think of the Riddler, they think of Frank Gorshin, the average person, the fan, and, you know, they, they've tried to do different versions of him, and it never sticks. It's always that version of the Riddler that sticks, and that's a, a tremendous testament to his performance. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's, it would be, have been interesting to see where it, the show would have gone or how it might have progressed Maybe, maybe it might have even lasted longer. I, I know that just sounds crazy, but, you know, I, I think that part of, like, the misstep of the second season was not having Gorshin there as the Riddler. I agree. I, uh, he, you definitely miss him in the second season. And even when he does pop up in the third season, it's not quite the same. You can tell his heart's not quite in it to the same degree that it was in the first season. Those early episodes are tremendous, and especially that first one where the writing was really crisp. You know, there was that sense of, uh, you know, they were still, particularly in the first episode, they were still finding their sea legs as far as the tone of the show. So there was that, that undercurrent of menace, even amid all of the camp and the Batusi and all the other stuff. There was a darkness to, you know, to a side of that character and he, he was doing a version of, you know, Richard Widmark, you know, who often played a lunatic and a heavy. And, you know, so there was a there, there was definitely a, an element to that villain, which was deeper than a lot of what you often saw on the show. So what would be your first choice or what would be a choice? Let's put it that way. 
Well, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of stay away from some of the, you know, I mean, you mentioned the Riddler, so I'm not going to mention the Riddler. One I'm gonna, I want to talk about, it goes to that point you made about how your, your opinion changes. And my, for me, I want, to, I want to mention King Tut. I'll do what I set out to do before. Abduct Bruce Wayne! Because as a kid, I couldn't stand him. I found that he was grotesque. I thought that he was shrill. I didn't get the joke. And as an adult, when you see Victor Buono, his performance is absolutely laugh out loud funny. Some of the best episodes, even all the way through the third season, which is which is of course a, a very uneven season, he's tremendous. He really, really grasped what it is that he wanted to do. He's got a tremendous comic timing. You know, so now I'm I'm glad that they're they're using him in the Batman sixty six comic. They've they've cut they he had a, a cameo you know, that version of the character had a cameo in the Batman Brave and the Bold cartoon. Yep. But I I find, you know, when, when, when I have an opportunity to watch a Victor Buono episode, and especially I love the outfits, you know, the, the, the over-the-top costumes that he got to wear, absolutely hilarious. I, I love him. See, now that's funny because he's one who, as a kid, I liked a lot. And as an adult, I don't find as endearing because, especially considering he was started in the first season where the first season was a bit more drama with comedic moments he was over the top and yes. and he really sticks out to me like a sore thumb i love victor bruno don't get me wrong i i mean he's he's been in a number of television shows from the yeah. 60s and 70s that i love but yeah. i just in watching these episodes now you know and and reviewing them so far i haven't been very favorable towards him yeah no i just i find his one liners to be to, and you know, and his delivery to be to be spot on, and you know the episode which I'm not sure you've gotten to yet. I don't think you have, where he bursts into the Batcave in the third season. No, not yet. Yeah, I, so I won't go off at length on it, but not to overuse the phrase, but it's a tour de force from beginning to end in that episode. He's just off his hinges, and I love it. I've got some theories about why so many people, because I, I see that. A lot of people point to that particular episode. And I've got some theories, but I'm not going to get into it until we get to the third season, because there's a lot to discuss there in general. Sure. So, My next villain, Roddy McDowell as the bookworm. Let's clean house, Batman. Now, Robin. Right by fine twisty worms. Attack! Oh my god, I mean, when, when, you know, this was the first villain that they did that was off, you know, the, the DC charts. It was their own creation. Right. And yet, here's Roddy McDowell, and he's fantastic in the role. I love the costume. I mean, even as a kid, there was that little part of me that wanted a leather suit. <laughs> Excuse me. That's funny. I always like the reading light hat. Yes. He's never been a big favorite of mine, but I definitely understand the appeal. And I also like that he's also, you know, again, they, they tap into the fact that he's he's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's 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 got that violent temper and, and and it's you know, they do give him a sense of menace that you wouldn't ordinarily and definitely I, I think they would have probably toned down in later episodes. But yes, it's. I agree. It's a. It's a good bit, and it and it really does play up the gimmick aspect of the villains on the show. So, what have you got next? On the flip side, from King Tide, I'm going to mention Egghead. Here we are, Batgirl. The hideout is through that door. Good. Then open the door and announce me, Egghead, and no tricks. Tricks. Oh, Batgirl, how could you suspect me of trying to trick you? Who, I gotta tell you, I know that this is gonna get me lynched in some quarters, or bat lynched, or bat hung up, or bat whatever, <laughs> is I'm not a big fan. I actually like Olga better than Egghead Ooh. in those episodes. And the, the, I just, I find Vincent Price, and people love Vincent Price, there is the cult of Vincent Price, and I, and I, and I get it, but I, I just never, enjoy those episodes except for certain elements i mean you know batgirl doing the dance of the you know the saber dance or or batman in, you know in the gigantic egg and i know that, you know again these are season three episodes so we're not going to really talk about him at great length but i just found him too creepy and i and i mean that in just unctuous and, and in not in an appealing way and i know that people love egghead 
but he's just not a character who who really he didn't I didn't love him as a kid and I still don't like him as an adult. So I just I don't I don't I'm not negative about the show in in many ways I tend to not talk about things that I don't like, but I did want to bring that up only because so many people do really enjoy that character and I just wanted to be contrarian about that one. <laughs> See now there you go that's funny because I'm the opposite in that regard. I right. like Egghead compared to Bono as King Tut. I felt he was right. never over the top because the fact is Egghead is a ridiculous character. He's stupid. Yes. He's yeah. stupid, but I felt he's that a great look, though. He's I'm, got a great look. He's got a great look. Yes, he does. But and, and and Price brings out something in him that makes him appealing. And you mentioned Olga, like as a kid. I don't know. Maybe my you know it'll change as I get to the third season episodes. I couldn't stand Olga. I me felt neither. I felt she diminished Egghead, which me seems too. weird. You me know? too. I, I I agree, but I have between. You know, Anne Baxter's performance as uh, Zelda the Great. Yes. And Olga in the third season. Again, also someone who I did not appreciate her comic, you know, el- you know, her comic delivery and her sex appeal too. Mm-hmm. I didn't appreciate as a kid, but watching her as an adult, she absolutely cracks me up. And I just, I, I love that she's clearly enjoying herself. So, yeah, I, I think she actually outshines him in, in what I've seen uh, uh, through adult eyes. Wow. Okay, my final villain, and here we go. This is, as a kid, not a big fan. As an adult, I really appreciated him. Van Johnson is the minstrel. I was regretting the necessity of doing away with you, Batman. A kindred genius, you know. But if there's anything I can't abide, it's a reformer. Activate the turn spit motor. Motor activated. In just a few minutes, gentlemen, we'll be prepared to serve barbecue crusader, if we have a call for it. You see, we've installed, just beneath you, super units of a radar-type grill. As you evolve, it can turn you from rare to medium to well done, depending on the preference. <laughs> I, I know that's going to surprise, because they're like, oh my god, this... but. I love the idea. Now, see, on paper, the minstrel sounds great. This is an electronics genius who, you know, and, and he wasn't, you know, obsessed with his theme the way others were. He, I mean, right. it was the gimmick. He could have been something else. He could have been called something else, maybe. But I liked it. I liked Van Johnson. I thought he didn't go over the top with, with the portrayal. I just think what happened was was that he got saddled with a kind of poor story so that people remember that. And also on the heels of Archer, which was just god-awful, yeah. that he gets lumped in there as a bad villain. I agree with you. You know, And as a kid, I used to get them confused. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. But yes, I agree with you. I think that it's actually a very entertaining episode. It's got a lot of good ideas. And actually, a lot of ideas that were in retrospect were appreciated about electronics and about crashing the market and and you know it, it it struck me as weird that they chose I, I it does feel like that classic early you know early second season especially I, I think they were a little bit lost in what they were doing they had gimmicks thrown together with ideas without any really co- without any real coherent vision and that episode is is one that really kind of hits for me on that because the idea of this minstrel and electronics and the market, none of it really mixes well together. There, there, there's no natural connection. I think if they'd come up with a better villain idea for him or a better concept for the story, I think there would have been a better you know, meshing of the two. But his performance, yes. You know, I, and I do like the idea of him kind of being in, you know, he was handsome and he had, a, he had charisma. I think there was definitely something there. But I think you're right. It misses the mark, and it doesn't help the fact that it came so close to the to the Archer episode, which is unwatchable. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Now, what is your last one? Well, I'm gonna. Here's where I'm gonna mention because I'm gonna mention. You know, my my all time favorite stuff. We'll talk in various aspects. So I'm not gonna. Like for example, I could go on. I could talk forever about Julie Newmar's Catwoman. You know, <laughs> I, and and but I'm I'm gonna save that for for different contexts as we do these other episodes this week. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Penguin. Friends and fellow citizens, I want to give you my solemn word that there will be no mudslinging in this campaign, unless, of course, my opponent slings it. But I intend 
to stick to the issues. Now, what are the issues? There is only one. Batman. Who is he? Who is this acrobatic clown who somersaults around Gotham City in a, <laughs> in a ridiculous costume? I suggest that behind that mask, Batman is, in reality, a dangerous criminal. Why else does he wear a mask? Why else does he conceal his past? Would you think about that a moment, my friends? Whenever you've seen Batman, who is he with? Criminals. That's who. You look in the old newspapers. Every picture of Batman shows him with thugs and with thieves and hobnobbing with crooks. Whereas my pictures show me always surrounded by whom? By the police. I am associate of the law. Again, another character, and, and I like the theme that kind of developed here just as we've been talking. The Penguin was a, is, a, is a, a character, particularly Burgess Meredith's performance, who of the big four, in my in my mind as a kid, he was always the fourth, and it, he always just seemed kind of non-threatening or whatever. I found again as an adult watching these episodes, and if when people get these discs this week, and if they're gonna, you know, I don't know what they've been watching on IFC or Me TV, or if they've got you know their own you know bootlegs or whatever. But the Burgess Meredith episodes, he's absolutely brilliant, and particularly those early episodes, that first appearance episode, and I agree with you, it's not as colorful as the Riddler, and I do think that they were, they were wise to start with the Riddler because it was, it was a great eye-catching episode. But in following it up with the Penguin, his comic timing is right on the money, but he also has that sense of menace, and he's smart, and he just, he really, really, you know, this, physically he's no match for Batman, and as a kid, I couldn't get past that. But as an adult, I could see where he would challenge Batman and basically drive him crazy every episode. Because he was always playing Batman against himself and, and, and tweaking him and finding ways to, to kind of drive him crazy, whether you know he would pretend to go straight or run for mayor. Although the mayor episode, I think, has got some great elements. I don't think it holds together. I just think that Burgess Meredith, it's almost like I feel like I need to apologize for the fact that I didn't recognize him you know, when I was a kid, because he is absolutely outstanding as the Penguin. I agree with you about, you know, his performance. I agree with you about the portrayal and all. I often felt, though, that out of the four villains, and this was ironic because they always said they had a script ready in case Burgess Meredith was available, yeah, they like they, they'd bring him in. I always yeah. felt he didn't get the best stories. I think some of his plots were a lot weaker. And to me, I didn't really get a feeling of, you know, the Penguin until the election one which we're actually going to be covering pretty soon on the podcast the closest other one being the one where you know he was uh trying to get married yes well there was always the the undercurrent or there was frequently the undercurrent of the this idea that he was trying to go straight and pretending to go straight and i think they went back to that well too often with him mm -hmm. because whether he was running a restaurant or trying to get married or running for mayor there was always some idea where Oh, I'm just going straight Batman, which which kind of stretched the joke a little bit too far, and I agree with you. As far as, you know, and I, I do think that that harmed him or harmed the character, but strictly speaking, his performance, particularly the first episode, which was, you know, of course it was based on an actual comic book episode or a comic book issue, uh, I, I think is, is, a, is a great, there's one scene very quickly where he's listening in on Batman and Robin talking in the Batcave. And you know the, the 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 conceit being that he's going to wait for Batman and Robin to plan his heists for him, and the, him listening with his henchmen behind him, and him getting excited as Batman and Robin are plotting this this heist for him, and then they realize that it can't be done, and then he just gives this little shrug, and every time he does it, I just think it's great. He just it's like oh well, and I I it's it's one of these things that when you watch it, it's just. He's so in character, and yet he's also giving a wink at the same time. It's his, He's great. Just terrific. Well, there you have it, folks. We've got six villains here that are notable to both Dan and myself. What are your favorite Bat villains? Head on over to the Facebook page for 13th Dimension 
or the Bat Cave podcast and let us know what are your favorite villains? What episodes are you looking forward to seeing these villains in as the DVD release comes out? Now, before we wrap things up here, we've got one little bit of business to do. We've got to pick a winner for this contest. I like the name, by the way, Funko. I like that company's name. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's 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 very 1950s. Yes, like, Ammo Funko. I yeah. like it. Yeah. So for the Funko Joker bobblehead doll, we're going to reach here into our bat drum of entries, and we're going to pick <laughs> one out. And our winner today is William Vega of Miami, Florida. So congratulations. Enjoy it. it uh, I hope uh, the Joker has a, a worthy spot on your bat shelf. Yes, absolutely. Make sure he's got a good home because, you know, if not, he has a tendency to sort of slip away and start causing trouble. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this episode of the Bat Cave Podcast. Tune in tomorrow. Our week-long celebration of the release of the DVD series and Blu-ray series continues as Dan and I take a look at the best bat gadgets in the series. I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, I, I, this is going to be good. So until next time, folks, make sure you're heading on over to 13thdimension.com. That's 13thdimension.com. And thebatcavepodcast.com. And checking out all the great material we have on both those websites. I mean, in 13th Dimension's case, it's not even just all, all Batman 66. It's everything superhero for you there. And I try and have some artifacts from the 66 series on the website there for you to look at, as well as past episodes of the podcast. So until next time, folks, thanks so much for listening. Dan, thanks so much for being here. No, thanks for having me, John. Take care, chumps. Thanks for listening, chums. I don't have a bat phone, but you can contact the Bat Cave podcast through its Facebook page, Twitter, email at thebatcavepodcast at gmail.com, or by phone at 888-866-9010. Subscribe to the podcast via Lipson.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Or through iTunes. The Bat Cave Podcast is part of a series of pop culture podcasts from the Chronic Rift Network. Find them at chronicrift.com. So until next time, citizens, same Bat Time, same Bat Cave Podcast. Bat